as they're going off to children's church, I'm thinking about how kids really do just say some of the, the funniest things, the, the silliest things. I, um, I was looking up as I was getting ready today. I was, I was trying to find some different things that kids say because it does seem that kids say they say silly things, they say cute things, they say truthful things, maybe when you don't want them to be truthful. The, the one that I'll share with you that, that I really, uh, got a kid, a, a little, I think it was a four or five-year-old, was with like a, a wedding of, of some sort, and they were, the parents were discussing with the kids about a cow, and, and this cow has multiple stomachs, okay? And that was, that was really what they were trying to get across, and this kid was just trying to think, okay, multiple stomachs, that's weird. And, and then all of a sudden, the, the little boy started to cry, and mom and dad couldn't figure out why they were crying. They were crying, and nothing could comfort them. And finally, tears, they, they finally discovered, why are you crying? Because when I get older, I don't want to get multiple stomachs. And they, the parents said, no, 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 it, that's cows. We're humans. We have one stomach. And the little boy in, in front of everyone there at the zoo lifted up his dad's shirt and say, no, one, two, three, and counting the stomachs on his dad. Um, sometimes kids can say funny things. Sometimes they can say truthful, hurtful things. Um, I can't imagine that, but um, I don't want multiple stuff. So anyway, um, I bring that up because there are times where kids, and, and I, I'm going to use that term loosely, right? When we're talking about kids, we can be talking about the little three-year-old. We can also be talking about the 43-year-old, right? Anybody have one of those kids, right? I think that there's times where kids need to be taught things. And, and I'm not up here, as I'm sure some of you are thinking, as a kid trying to teach things, I'm up here to remind us, because that really is the word of the day, remember. We want to be reminded of things. And the thing is that kids or people in general will never be able to remember something if they first had it in the first place. You follow? Anyone here have, have, a, have a journal? Anyone keep a journal of any sort? Awesome. Very neat. So I keep a journal. It's a little public. I actually have a blog online. And I'm not doing any sort of self-promotion here or anything like that. But this last week, the, the topic that really got my attention was this word, remember. The pastor said, hey, I need you to preach tomorrow. That was already on my mind, this term, remember. And I think it's important for us to remember things, even if we can write them down. And I'm not just talking about where I put my keys or remember to get milk when you're at the grocery store. I need to write those things down too anyway. Um, but I'm talking about the things that God has done in our lives. Anybody have one of those? Anybody have something that God has done in your life and it's not just worth sharing, it's worth remembering forever and ever and ever. There are good things that each and every one of us, if we're in this room and if we're breathing, God has done something in our life that is worth remembering. So if you will, open up your Bible to the book of Joshua. Joshua, we're going to start in chapter 3. So just to give us broad context, the nation, the children of Israel, have been enslaved in Egypt for many, many years. And they have been under oppression. And God, he uses this, this guy named Moses. And he says, Moses, I'm going to use you. You're going to be my tool. I'm going to use you to lead my 
people out of Egypt. We call that the Exodus. And so the Israelites, they are coming out of Egypt and God is leading them out with a strong and a mighty hand. God does many wonderful works. And so people of Israel, they are now, they've crossed the Red Sea. They have received the Ten Commandments. And they are now at the doorstep of the promised land. This land that God said, I have given to you and your fathers and your generations to come. This is the land that I have promised you. They're on the doorstep. And what do they do? They just walk right in. Oh, they send 12 spies in to check out the land and Spoiler alert, only two of them were faithful. Ten of them said, this is a terrible land. We, we, we're fearful. We'll be struck down. We cannot do it. And Joshua and Caleb said, oh, God will carry us through. He has given us this land. We must go and take it. But the people, the, the nation, they sided with the ten and not Joshua and Caleb. And so for 40 years, forced to, we all know it, right? wander through the desert, go through the wilderness, and there is, there is literally, they are walking and wandering through the desert. Why? So that those that were unfaithful, those that did not want to trust God, those that did not want to go into the promised land, that they would die off. That was the whole purpose of this wandering through the desert time. But God is still faithful. God still led them. A, a pillar of, of fire by day and a Pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day, right? That seems to work a little bit better. God led them. He provided food for them to eat. God is good and faithful even through this time of wilderness wandering. And so the 40 years that are up, the, the whole entire nation was that, that generation that decided not to trust, trust God. They have died off and a new generation is there. And they are now standing at the doorstep of the land. But how are they going to get in? There's this giant river that stands in their way. And it's not just a giant river. It's a river at flood stage. Just coming down. I remember when I was young, I was uh, with my parents. We were driving somewhere, and we crossed the Mississippi River. It was so neat. We're, we're going, and, and I, I'm in the back, and I can't see all that almost we're on the bridge we're we're not okay there yet are we over water yep we're over water okay great and i'm used to the little streams the little the little rivers around here and i said okay done yet we're, we're on the other side yet now right nope still over water and i remember feeling <laughs> more and more anxious. When, when are we ever going to not be over water? I don't think that the Jordan River is as big as the Mississippi River at, at, at certain areas, but just the idea of this river at full flood stage. And you have a whole mass of people to get from one side to the other. I've led mission, missions trips. It's hard to get some masses of people from one spot to the other. It is a tough, difficult job. But Joshua has this standing in front of him, and, and he, he trusts God. God says, I have this specific plan. We are going to, you're going to have the Levites. They're going to carry the Ark of the Covenant. And this Ark, you've, you've anybody seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones, right? That's a great picture, but that's not the kind of picture I want us to have in our in our when we think about the ark, what I want us to think about the ark is God's presence amongst his people. That's the representation right there. And so they have the ark, and they're about to step into the Jordan. And God says, when they step, the waters will stop. And the whole entire nation will walk across on dry land. So let's look in verse 14 of chapter 3. Let us begin there. Chapter 3 of Joshua, verse 14. So when the people set out of their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the, in the brink of the water, now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. 
the waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away. This river that is flowing constantly, God says, walk into it with the ark and it will stop flowing. It'll just become this heap of water down upstream. And we'll be able to walk across on dry land. Let's continue. Verse uh, 17. Now the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stern, stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing, passing over the Jordan. And they are standing on dry ground. Now, it, it's so incredible. I love the wording that the Bible uses. This isn't just muddy ground. This isn't, you know, the water went away and now it's kind of boggy. It is dry ground. This is God 100%. This is a miracle. This is a great thing that God is doing in the midst of his people at this moment. This is an incredible thing. This is a great show of God's might. God's power, God's care for his people, his love for his people. God is continuing to fulfill his promise and bring them into the promised land. Chapter 4, verse 1. When all the nation had finished passing, passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, each from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. I can almost imagine myself being one of those 12 that were chosen. And here I am walking across. I'm kind of looking in amazement. Wow, this river is, is, is I'm walking on dry ground. This is neat. I see this of water down upstream. And it's not coming to bury me. I, I can walk across, and then Joshua goes, oh yeah, those 12 that I selected before, come on, we're, we're going back into the middle of the, of the stream. I could almost see myself going, I just grabbed it on my way across. That seems like it would have been easier, but I think it demonstrates the obedience of these 12. It demonstrates the obedience of Joshua. Because we even see a few verses later, we'll, we'll look at verse 9. We'll read uh, starting at verse 9. And Joshua st set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant have stood, and they are there to this day. So there's two things happening. Two sets of 12 stones is stones that are heavy. It, the Bible says that the men put them on their shoulders. Twelve stones that these men had to take from the middle of the river that was dry ground and carry them to the other side so that the place that they were encamping at, they could set up this memorial. There's these 12 stones that need to be carried across. And there's a second thing that God does not instruct, but Joshua takes it upon himself. Joshua takes now 12 other stones and sets them up in the middle of of that river riverbed where the priests were standing with the ark while there is still dry ground. You all following that? And so there's two things going on right now. The first is the obedience of Joshua and these men and, and really the whole nation of Israel to trust God and, and to walk across the, the, the river, the dry ground. And then you have Joshua who understands this is an important thing. And I want to set up this memorial because I want to remember that at this spot, even though I won't see it once the water starts rushing again, I want to remember at this spot, God stopped the waters. God did this great, mighty, powerful work. Let's continue on. Go to verse 19, still in chapter 4. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of the Jericho. And these, those 12 stones which they had took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal, and he said to the people of Israel, 
When your children ask their fathers in time to come, what do these stones mean? We'll stop right there. We'll stop right there. Remember, I started off about kids saying the, the cutest, funniest things. And what's another thing that kids do? They ask why. They ask why. We're all, as human beings, are, are curious. It seems that maybe when we're older, we get a little less curious, maybe to our own detriment, right? But here are these kids, and, and God says, when your children ask in times to come, why are these stones here? You need to have an answer for them, right? And so here is Joshua and, and the people, this generation that is standing there, and they have all witnessed this miracle takes place. They have all understood that we are taking these 12 stones and we're going to set them up so that we can remember what God is because we're forgetful. Amen? We're forgetful. Amen? <laughs> Yeah, all right. We are forgetful. I can't tell you how many things I've forgotten. Can't tell you how many times Ashley said, did you get that? And I just hang my head. No, I'd, I'll go back to the store, get more milk. <laughs> we are forgetful people. And the worst thing about being a forgetful person is that we're so prone to forget the mighty works that God has done. We can praise his name today on Sunday and Monday comes, and we forget why he's so worthy. Maybe intellectually we understand. Maybe intellectually we know the facts and the truth. But emotionally, are we remembering just why and how he is so worthy of all of our worship, all of our praise, because of the great and mighty things that he has done? And so God tells jo Joshua, you set these stones up so that you guys remember. And here's another thing. When your children in time ask, you need to have an answer for them. Let's find out what that answer is. Verse 22. Then you shall let your children know, Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did at the to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. There's a phrase that's repeated in, in those verses right there, the Lord your God. And that's a phrase that I want to repeat to myself on a daily basis. Why did I wake up this morning? For the Lord my God woke me up. I am standing here today because the Lord, my God, is faithful. Why do I have freedom in Christ and forgiveness of sin? Why are my chains of sin gone? For the Lord, my God, has carried me through. And so it's important that we remember what God has done for us. And it's important that we pass it on. If you understand, if you listen to that passage, there is this first layer that we remember. There's the next layer that our future generations remember. Our friends, our, those that are younger than us, those that just need to know. And what's the last layer? The ends of the earth. Everyone needs to know and understand how good God is, how mighty he is, the power that he has. Let's go down to uh, verse 19 once again. I, I just got to read this again. Then the people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal. Do you understand those details right there? These aren't just filler words. I, anybody ever been in school and the teacher? You're, you know, sit down and read this assignment, and, and what are you doing? You're skimming, you're looking for what? The important words. We're trying to skip over the filler words, and we just want to get to what's important. Well, the Bible has no filler words. If there's a word in the Bible, God put it there for a specific reason. And so why do we have what might seem as filler words? The people came up on the 10th day of the first month, and they camped at Gilgal. Do you 
what, do, what do we hear there? What do we understand? It was a specific day, in a specific month, at a specific location, that God did this great thing. And friends, I think that we need to understand and remember the specific day, at the specific place, specific time that God has done these great things in our life. I'll be, I'll be real frank with you, that I remember exactly where I was when I gave my heart to Jesus. I remember the exact place and, and the exact place in that room. And I could tell you the, the general month, but I, I can't tell you the exact day. And that frustrates me because I, I, I was with a, an elderly saint not too long ago, and they said, you know, I gave my life to Jesus. March, I forget what said, uh, in, in 1955, 5.55 p.m. And I'm sitting there, I'm going, that's amazing. I wish I had that. But at least I have the memory and the understanding of what it was that Jesus did in my heart. I remember what I felt. I remember the realization that I had. There are great things that God has done in our lives, and we need to remember them. We need to remember them. Excuse me. So, I wasn't, re- I wasn't mentally prepared to preach today, so that's my excuse for the groggy voice. Here we go. Here is a, a good, good God who has brought Israel to the promised land. And this is the way that they start off. With this great miracle, this incredible thing ha- has happened, and this memorial for them and for future generations and for the rest of the world to remember what God has done. What is going on in your life? Are you remembering what God has done in your life? Is that giving you encouragement for today and tomorrow? Is that prompting you to obey him? Is it reminding you he has been so good and so faithful to me in the past, I have no other choice but to trust in him once again. What about those future generations, our kids, our grandkids, those that we just know and and that are younger than us? Have we told them the stories of what God has done? Have we explained to them and, and let them just relish in the things that God has brought us through? One of days is going to, and Joe announced it, men's breakfast. Because I'm the youngest one there. And I get to sit. That That's not a shocker by any way. Like, I'm not revealing anything. And I get to sit, and you know what I get to do? I get to listen to some stories of what God has done. I get to listen to 75 what was that like? I don't know, but a lot of those gentlemen do. And they can tell me what God did in that year. Or they can tell me about how for an entire lifetime before I was God was faithful. That is important. We can't lose out on that. We are, we are depriving ourselves and others of blessing, of, of good, solid truth when we fail to pass that on. So the first is we need to remember what God has done in our lives. The second is we need to pass that on and allow others to to understand what God's done. I've had the blessing to to travel to many places and I love going and 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 looking at memorials, whether it's Washington DC or Boston or in Europe, different places, and seeing a plaque that says, on this site, at this date, this happened. And I wasn't around for it, and I can't even imagine the... the and it teaches me something. Just how much more can it teach someone for you to share what God did in your life? 
at a time. So the first, once again, we need to remember for our own sake. Second is we need to remember and we need to teach for the sake of others. And the third is that we proclaim to the world just how good, how great, how loving, how caring, how mighty our God is. I want to close with John chapter 16. You can run there or you can just, uh, just listen up. John chapter 16. I'm going to start at verse 32. Jesus says, Behold, the hour is coming, indeed as come, when you will be scattered each to his own home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not going alone, for the Father is with you, is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. That's something we got to remember, right? Each and every day, we're going through trouble. We're going through tribulation. There are things that are happening to us, to people we love, to people we know, people we don't know. Each and every day. But we got to remember that. Jesus saying, it's okay. Take heart. Be of good courage. I have overcome this world. There is nothing too big for our God. There is nothing too great for our God. There is nothing he can't handle, and there's nothing in our lives that he doesn't care about. He has overcome the world. That's something worth remembering. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are a good God. You love us. You care for us. You know us. Lord, help us to remember the things that you've done in our lives. If we believe in Jesus, help us to remember that time will we put our trust in him. Help us to remember the truth found in your word. Re- help us to remember the times that you've carried us through, that you've dragged us through, that you've lifted us up. Let us never forget those things. Now, let us never forget just how wonderful and powerful you are. Help us to teach and pass that along to others so that the world will know just how wonderful you are. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When I graduated, uh, Bible College, I was standing there at graduation, and we had all just received our, our pieces of paper. We had gone on stage and shook the president's hand, and we were standing there, and we were getting ready to, to leave, and this song was played. And I, I used to say I'm not a big crier, and I'm not an emotional guy, but I guess that's been proven wrong uh, over the last couple of years. But I remember standing there, and I couldn't even sing the, the words anymore because this whole entire um, building is, is, is just singing about the goodness and the faithfulness of our God. And I remember crying because I remembered all the time that I wasn't faithful to him. And even when I wasn't faithful to him, he was still faithful to me. And then uh, two, three years go by, and I, I, I go through seminary, And I didn't go to graduation, but I remember in the mail came in this tube, this other piece of paper, and I walk in the house holding this piece of paper, and guess what song is playing? Just about how good and faithful our God is. And and I just, when we sing this song here, we're just going to sing one verse. But when we are not faithful, he still is. When we fail him, he doesn't fail us. When we don't love him with our actions, he loves us. We got to remember that.